Good morning. And uh, I think it's still morning. Usually by this time of the day, we're well into office hours and have seen a number of patients and got raked over the cold a few times and uh, had probably 50 phone calls. So uh, this is really nice to be here in uh, such a relaxing environment and to see uh, so many faces that I haven't seen in a while and uh, to, to actually meet one in the restroom, my uh, former English teacher, uh, Dr. Graves, and you know, he looked at me, I looked at him, you know, guys don't talk in the restroom. <laughs> but we figured out, oh, okay. But uh, again, I am just so honored to be here this morning, uh, to have been uh, invited to come and to share my thoughts uh, with you. Uh, particularly, I want to uh, thank Dr. Jones, um, a fellow Haywood Countyan, uh, who uh, gave me a call and uh, invited me. I want to thank uh, Chancellor Rakes and uh, also current BSA President, uh, Ms. Bonds, who also I found out is was originally from Haywood County as well. So um, with that, let me um, also share with you is a little bit of, of, of the background that I brought to uh, University of Tennessee Martin in 1969. Uh, as I do so, my, uh, and as I present my thoughts this morning, I really want to take my time uh, and stress some things that I think are really important uh, and then hopefully uh, the BSA president and others uh, in her generation will be able to take away a couple of nuggets that allows them to bridge the gap, because that's what it's all about. To look back at one's history, look back at one's heritage, and not to learn something from that that will allow us to be better and allow us to build on that is a total waste. So. Uh, I want to share and remind some of us in my age group about some of these things that we hold so dear, but most important, hopefully I can challenge the younger generation to pick up the gauntlet and to move past and to do better than what we did. Um, I think you can better understand maybe my, my comments if you understood where I was in 1969. Uh, as uh, Dr. Jones has said, I was the third Black Student Association president. I came in 1969, but I came from a farm background, actually closer to Stanton, Tennessee than Brownsville. Uh, there are two towns in Hayward County. Brownsville is the seat. Stanton is a town of about 500 people, and most of us live outside of the city limits of Stanton. I lived on a farm. Two, uh, my dad and mom, both very independent thinkers. Um, they owned their own farm. Uh, my dad had been a sharecropper for a short period of time, but he came from a family that um, my great-grandfather actually was a fairly large uh, property owner. Dad grew up as a sharecropper. However, he noted the lifestyle that his, grandfa his grandfather had and as a property owner, and he was always intent on being one himself and being independent. He always said, I want to be my own man, and that was what he basically drilled at us every day. So when you grow up on a farm, you work together as a unit every day. You get up, you do chores, and during that time, you also are taught things. You learn things that you don't even realize you're learning. But one of the things that uh, I learned from without even realizing at the time. In 1958, I would have been about seven or eight years old, um, eight to be specific. And that was when the initial voters registration drive in Hayward County to get African Americans to the, the privilege of actually being registered and voting. My parents were part of that leadership organization that actually made that happen. Uh, with uh, some, some uh, Senator Estes Kefar, I think, was the senator at that time. And there were others who actually were pushing that effort. They stood out in the hot sun and they took verbal and physical abuse in 58 and 59 to be able to register to vote. 
as a little kid, I saw this but didn't realize what was happening. Then, at, a, at the age of 13 years old, I uh, was approached by a group of college students uh, who were, uh, as we knew then, Freedom Riders, and they came together after being mentored by Floyd McKissick, who was head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a student wing that uh, was trying to do more aggressively some of the things that Dr. Martin Luther King was doing. So at 13, I and a 16-year-old formed an organization which was a subunit of SNCC, a Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And during that summer, we, with a group of maybe 25 or 30 other students and maybe five college students, all of whom were Caucasian, uh, we integrated by virtue of sit-ins and marches all of the public facilities in Hayward County. So summer was over, we got a consent decree, and all of these things uh, were, were desegregated. There were two adults who worked with us. One was my father, another was a Vietnam veteran. So again, that was the background that I came from. So this was 1964. 1965, um, there was so-called freedom of choice, the first time in Hayward County where st black students were um, given the privilege of actually attending any school that you chose to go to. Um, my parents and uh, my eighth grade uh, teacher at the time uh, encouraged me as part of a group of about 18 students to attend the high school there, Hayward High School, which formerly had been all white students. There was an enrollment of about 1,000 about students. So I was part of about 18 students who went to Hayward High School at that time in 1965. My class was the first one that graduated in 1969 with four years of an integrated situation. And what we learned as people, as students, uh, as Americans uh, during those four years is something that I could probably write five books about if I just had the time. But I came to UT Martin with that background. Now, uh, we have an organization called BSA, a Black Student Association. Uh, it was started to grow, but uh, was not extremely active on campus at that time. I met Henry Lewis, who was the other gentleman that uh, you see in the picture outside in the foyer, and we just kind of hit it off. We had a lot of things in common. Henry was from inner city Memphis uh, in the projects, as we called it, and I was from outer city Stanton on a farm. I mean, how opposite could you be? But we had mutual interest in moving UTM and moving our society ahead. And that's what I want to share through the rest of this presentation and then open it up for questions and answers because I really want to spend more time on the, that phase of things. I've found over the years that typically the questions you ask uh, in a venue like this are more important than probably what I say. So with that in mind, um, let's see, let me get this where I can see my notes here. I'm getting a little, getting a, getting a little older here, as they say. Um, this, this 50 years, uh, I'm actually part of it. I, I, in fact, I can vividly recall that in 1969, uh, we just had a sense of urgency uh, about uh, what was going on at the time. We felt that uh, we needed to develop an organization uh, through which we, uh, as a small group of black students, uh, could have the opportunity to, create, to basically have one voice. Uh, when there's not many of you, one thing you have to have is unity. And we wanted a unified voice in regards to several things. One was equal access to work-study type programs. Uh, there were certain jobs that weren't equally accessible. Uh, we also wanted um, a equal access when it came to uh, representation on the student council. When it came to uh, recruitment of more African-American faculty, more African-American administrators, we saw the need to include in the curricula uh, African-American studies that would be available for all the students, not just African-Americans, because we felt that not only did we need to learn more about those cultures and that history, but the rest of the student body as well. We also felt the need to um, make sure that historically black Greek organizations
could be organized on the campus and also be part of the Panhellenic Council. Uh, to have representation, as I said, not just on the student council uh, by virtue of holding an office, but that there was a subcommittee there that also basically suggest, selected the speakers that would come to campus, the entertainers that would come to campus. We wanted equal access to that as well. If you could summarize, I guess, our, our sense of uh, duty uh, at that time, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King had written a letter called The Letter from the Birmingham Ham Jail. And he stated, and we literally, we took it literally when he said that we, you are, you are, com you are compelled to carry the banner of freedom beyond your hometown. And we just felt that it didn't matter who got credit for anything that the organization accomplished. We just wanted to get the job done. Um, some of the changes that we experienced and witnessed during the four years I was here from 1969 to 73 were largely due to a very activist organization, the BSA. Uh, those things were the university acquired several black faculty administrators uh, in addition to those that were there. Uh, it also added black history and black literature courses uh, that would be available for all students. Uh, we uh, also uh, obtained and were uh, given representation on the student council. We also were, became members of the speakers and entertainment uh, selection committee. Three historically black uh, fraternities and at least two sororities were organized on the campus and were admitted to the Panhellenic Council. Now be assured that there were occasion faculty, administrators, and students who joined us in this effort uh, because they also had a commitment to a sense of fairness uh, that all men, all students here at UTM should enjoy. Uh, they joined us in the same fashion that students had uh, joined us in 1964 when we were marching in the streets, when we were sitting in at restaurants to accomplish the same purpose, and that it was equal opportunities to succeed or fail based on what you did, uh, rather than being locked out, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> the prevailing attitude among African-American students at that time was very similar to something called Sanaku, S-A-N-A-K-H-O-U. It's a concept of friendship that dates back to actually our tribal roots in pre-colonial Africa. That was a concept that neighbors have uh, in regards to each other as far as friendship. It uh, was something that was not taken casually, uh, it was taken seriously. And it was a code, if you will, even among warriors. Uh, the Sanaku was uh, one of the key concepts of friendship as we know it today. Essentially, it was the first time that uh, the notion of I, of I have your back was actually put forward. And that was the attitudes that we had one for another here at UTM as African-American students at that time. You didn't have a situation where one student would do something to harm the other. Sanako was real, and it was something that we practiced every day uh, back in those days. The, the idea of Sanako and our uh, tribal roots was not something that was casual. It was taken personally, it was taken professionally. It became a major dynamic of tribal culture at that time. Uh, in fact, brotherhood, fellowship, and family were the core community values in those uh, African tribes. Think how different our society would be if we practiced Sanaku today. Not just on our college campuses, what if we practice that kind of, uh, those kinds of principles in our society today? As I pondered the uh, needed linkage, if you will, of bridging uh, the efforts of the first uh, BSAs pa in the past to the present and also to the future. I was reminded of what Ebony Magazine editor Emeritus Lerone Bennett said in 2005 when Mrs. Rosa Parks died. 
And he said this, and I quote, and of course we finally know her as a mother of the civil rights movement. But he said, she reminds us at a time when many need reminding that one woman or one man can make a difference and that every man and every woman ought to try. It's not enough to praise her from afar. It is not enough to uh, quote her accolades. He says, uh, her, her life, her death, call us to the task of continuing the unfinished freedom movement and to ensure that she did not live, that she did not dream, and that she did not die uh, after struggling in vain. As we stood here at UTM on the shoulders of people like Dr. Harold Connors, like Dr. J.C. Owen, you also, BSA members today, stand and should be proud of and take advantage of the shoulders of the previous members of BSA that you can look back to uh, as examples. The passion that, had, that they had, the energy that we had. But understand the strategies that we used then in most cases would be ineffective and would be inappropriate today. You have to look at your needs and you have to come up with appropriate strategies to address the challenges that you have today. In fact, effective leaders have always been those that have the ability to make mid-course adjustments, to realize where you are, not to get stuck in the mud, not to have your head stuck in the sand. In fact, uh, we should always be reminded, as Will Rogers said, that if you're out lead as a leader and nobody is following you, you may just be out for a leisurely walk. As we look at some of the media appointed national African American leaders today, if we actually take an honest assessment of their strategies, oftentimes their selfish motives, and their commercialization of the plight of others, the lack of any meaningful results, I think we have to come to a conclusion in many cases that those leaders, those oftentimes media appointed leaders, actually are irrelevant in today's society. They're irrelevant in regards to solving problems that face not only the African American community, but problems that face America in general. The, we have to realize that there are common interests. We are no longer, as African Americans, the largest minority population. So therefore, wisdom says, look for and form coalitions with people of like mind, people who have like interests, people who have like dreams, people who have common needs. And therefore, it allows us to do things that we otherwise wouldn't. Coalitions or teams that we need to be forming today and strategies that we use today have to be different from the ones that we used in 1960s and the 1970s. Um, I would urge us to do something first at home. As they say, charity starts at home. Introspective reviews should start at home. We need to look first at our BSAs. We need to look at our other college organizations. We need to look at our own homes. We need to look at our own churches. We need to look at our own Greek organizations, our other community and civic organizations, and decide who we are, who we need to become to be effective in this world, and what we need to get there, what coalitions we need to form to uh, reach that point. Have you ever thought about the fact that it's regardless of how much so-called political power you have, if that political power does not translate into economic power, it is a pipe dream. 
political power that is not converted or not translated into economic power is like trying to hold light in your hand. Nothing ever gets accomplished. So how do we make that giant leap? We form coalitions with people who have similar needs, similar interests, similar commitments, who have similar dreams for their children that we have, or in your cases, you're, you're younger, that you will have for your children. Have you ever noticed that uh, other people of color, whether they come from Jamaica, whether they come from the Caribbean, Barbados, whether they come from uh, Southeast Asia, whether they're Hispanic, whether they come from East or West Africa. When it comes to individual as well as collective economic growth, the relative rates at which those people gain economic freedom is significantly different from the majority of us as African Americans. What's the difference? It seems to me that we can't use the pigment of our skin as the only reason. Maybe we need to look at, is there a difference in the willingness to step outside of the box that we have allowed ourselves to be painted into? Maybe it's the willingness to form coalitions with people of like mind who aren't necessarily part of our immediate community or our immediate families. Just a thought. And I mention that simply because of the necessity that I perceive of needing to form different coalitions. Of you as the current Black Student Association and leaders of today and tomorrow, of needing to have different strategies for moving ahead. The need for us to not allow people to, again, either speak for us, not knowing what our needs really are, and taking this for granted, or the other side to totally ignore because the assumption is we are going to be involved anyway. Just a thought, just a challenge. In the 1960s and 70s, African Americans made major advances on many fronts. College campuses through organizations like our BSA, we had the support of and the good consciousness of the majority of this planet on which we live. The world looked at the struggles of those people who were, uh, who had dogs put on them, who had fire hoses put on them, who were beaten as they marched nonviolently in Montgomery and other places like that. Why did we have the world's consciousness on our side? Because we had principles that supported and practiced uh, as a people that would encourage and would demand that the world come to uh, help us in what we were doing. We made at that time God, family, and our claim to this country be the platforms on which we actually stood, the platforms on which we actually worked and pursued the promise of our U.S. Constitution to the point of even death. Those were the principles that we used to get to where we got. Uh, but you know, once my age group accomplished some things and we had eliminated some, um, some, some legal barriers. We got out and we got good jobs. You know, we got an MD degree. We got uh, other degrees in areas that maybe a number of us had not done before in the numbers that we were. But we became so busy making a living until oftentimes we stopped living. We got caught up in the rat races. And we did not oftentimes give to your generation the knowledge that you needed to know what your heritage was, know what your heritage is. We oftentimes did not relate to you the experiences that we had in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Therefore, your generation comes to college, your generation comes to UT and other college campuses without the kind of background and the commitment to fairness and the commitment that you needed to do something to move society along in the way that I came from that farm background, and the way that I came from a family that was committed to equality for all men and women. My parents were no different from your parents 
and substance. The difference is I'm the age of your parents. And we, my generation, got so caught up in making a living because we had some new freedoms, if you will, until so many of us forgot to share with you what our parents shared with us. The result is a sense that you don't need to do anything in the way that we did. Well, I'm here because I think that you have in you a passion, you have in you a commitment. It's just that that fire needs to be tended to and we need to get it going again. But we need to accept the fact and we need to admit in my generation that we failed in a lot of ways. We need to admit also that so many of our so-called leaders in the African-American communities, particularly at the national level, have failed us and failed you in a number of ways. We have to realize that and accept the fact that there is in so many cases no relevance anymore. And it's no wonder that your generation, I'm, my children, they are adults, they're young adults, but they've told me this makes no sense anymore. You know, we're doing the kinds of things and the, the rhetoric is such that it has no relevance to your needs today. Well, who's gonna change that? You have to be the ones to change that. And I'm here today to say that there are some of us who are willing to support you in that change. As a university sanctioned organization, I challenge you to get outside the college campus and to help to spread the word about education. That message is this, education is key to, the, to all poor people. It is the great equalizer. Education has a direct monetary payoff, make no mistake. But you know what else it does? It delivers a certain independence. It delivers that independence regardless of whether there's subtle discrimination. It delivers that independence regardless of whether there is a, relig a re residual uh, discrimination. Let me repeat that. Education is the key for all poor people. It is the great equalizer. And I would encourage you, get outside of the college campus and promote that. And let me conclude my linkage of the past Black Student Association to the BSA and its supporters of today by simply reminding and challenging you, you young people today, you the staff, faculty, uh, administrators who support them today, that you are the heirs, you are the heirs of the positive things that have been done by others before you. But you must now become the architects of the things that are to come in our future. You are to become the architects of things that are to come for all Americans. All Americans uh, where you live, work, and play. Specifically, we're at the crossroads in our history. America is at a crossroads. Black America is at a crossroads. And the question is, will we step up to the challenge of what needs to be done or will we shrink back from our duties and will we surrender our futures to the control of some who will totally ignore us or to the control of those who simply assume that this is what we want done? It's left up to us. C. Mason Weaver, who's a good friend of mine, who's an activist, uh, who is an author, and he wrote a book titled, It's Okay to Leave the Plantation. And a, a quote or a statement that he made in this book was one that uh, I'd like to leave for you, this generation and the next generation. And that is a reminder that our ancestors, the first generation of freed slaves, took advantage of their freedom. They took advantage of their freedom by self-determination and by their imagination. And it is that commitment, self-determination and imagination that will allow you to come up with effective strategies and effective uh, commitments, effective coalitions, effective uh, resources that will allow America and black Americans specifically whether it's on college campuses 
or beyond uh, to become successful and to meet the challenges that we face. So thank you for allowing me to share a variety of, 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 of ideas, share some challenges with you, and to let you know where we were in 1969 and 70, and the fact that you are on a different planet almost. And look at what we did, learn from it, learn from our mistakes, benefit from our successes, but understand that you must, must come up with different strategies. Don't be like so many of our national leaders who are stuck in 1950s and 1960s, and therefore we aren't moving in ways that we could because resources are being wasted and the passion oftentimes is not there. Thank you so much, and I will be available for questions, and hopefully that will be the most valuable part of this experience today. Thank you. The floor is now open for questions. If anyone has questions for Dr. Cannon. It's a little, it's a, the, with the lights, it's a little bit harder for me to see out there too, so I may not see your hands, maybe you stood. I think it, well, not I think, I know it prepared me because there were so many challenges. One of the things, see, I, when you're born in the 50s, everything, every step of the way uh, as an African-American student, you were sort of like some of the first, if not the first. Well, one of the advantages of being at UTM was it was a small campus. It was a more intimate relationship you developed uh, relationship with your faculty, uh, your advisors, like you, Dr. Graves, who were able to mentor you in ways that you might not have at larger college campuses or larger metropolitan uh, uh, areas. So UT Martin prepared us to go out into a world that was, was very cruel in some cases, but also we were very prepared because we were used to stepping up, we were used to uh, going to, to, to faculty, administrators, we're used to uh, dealing with our fellow students in a way that developed a sense of confidence, that there was nothing that you couldn't at least approach and try to solve. But you did it in a way that we did here at UT Martin, and that was by, again, coming together with people of like mind and trying to see, first of all, what you had in common rather than ac accentuating and exaggerating the differences. We always looked for what can we do together and how can we make this thing work. So UTM's uh, education, uh, the, the educational experience, the social experience, I'm not talking about you know the, the big parties and that sort of thing, because obviously there's not a whole lot socially to do at Martin, but we figured out ways to have a social life too, but it prepared us very well for life, for medical school, and for being a parent, which uh, in, uh, I think is the most important thing that I do. Yes, sir. Campus life? Uh, again, I think the student body might have been between 2,500 and 3,000 students. So, you know, that itself tells you a little bit about it. Um, again, not nearly as much on campus uh, s activities in terms of uh, some of the things that I understand that you guys have available to you now from a social standpoint. However, again, we were breaking new ground in the 60s and 70s on a campus that predominantly white uh, uh, student body, most of us were coming from backgrounds where it had been a, been a segregated society. We were just starting to move into uh, an integrated society. So some of the same problems that we had dealt with in high school, all of us, you know, blacks and whites, uh, students and faculty and administrators, as well as other staff here on the campus, we were all getting used to each other. 
we were all learning different cultures. But the overwhelming majority of us, regardless of what you, where you came from, we were willing to learn about other people. And uh, there were some clashes, uh, of clashes of the different cultures, different ideas, uh, and there were people who were resistant to being inclusive at that time. But you had a group of people who said, you will be inclusive, and that we just kept banging, so to speak. But we did it in a way that was nonviolent. We did it in a way that was uh, professional, and we made our points. We, we, we basically brought logic to the process. And when you found people that you could form coalitions with, then things got done. Yes. Well, they, so, oftentimes they were actually some of the speakers that were brought to campus. Um, some that were um, maybe considered controversial. Uh, there were speakers that would bring subject matter to the campus that uh, stimulated conversation about things that maybe we wouldn't ordinarily talk about. Um, we'd bring varieties of entertainers. An example of, of someone uh, that would uh, force you to have to talk to each other about those kinds of issues of the day uh, Julian Bond, uh, who was very relevant in that day. Uh, I find, unfortunately, that today Julian Bond has sort of lost his way. But uh, at that time, he was a young man who was on top of his game, who brought real uh, ideas, real solutions to the, the problems that we faced. Um, entertainment, uh, they, you, you had entertainment, you had soul entertainers like the Supremes. You had um, um, several of the rock and roll bands. In other words, we all got together in social settings, academic settings, um, and also the, the classes like black literature co courses. Uh, you had equal representation. We, it gave us an opportunity when you read books like Soul on Ice and Black Like Me, those kinds of, and, and, and other uh, kinds of, of African-American literature that uh, whites oftentimes had never been exposed to. And we l developed an appreciation for the two cultures. Yes. Right. One is just simply to take advantage of every opportunity in the high school as well, uh, particularly in junior high and high school, of the math and science courses as well as reading comprehension. I mean, one of the big things is this sort of mis misunderstanding that you got to know everything about science and math to make it in medicine. You know what? I find that the biggest, most important thing is reading comprehension because if you do that well, You've got the book as well as the instructors, and you can do the rest. The rest of it is about just simply grinding it out. If you can read, reading comprehension, obviously taking the basic math and science courses, and, and you have to have a sort of a, a, a love for it. But the rest of it is just persistence, grind it out. <laughs> and there's no better place to get a pre-medical or pre-health profession um, education than here at Martin. I mean, we the numbers, the percentage of students admitted to medical school from UT Martin at UT in Memphis was always greater than any place else because we had terrific teachers in the programs here. We were small enough that we got personal uh, attention and it was just the, 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 the teachers here in the programs were just tops. So, you know, we looked around in my class and Virtually everybody in my class who wanted to go to medical school uh, from here got in medical school. You just have to grind it out. Yes, ma'am. The funnest memory was, you know, actually just seeing, quite honestly, seeing us as black students come together and any project that we had seen it accomplished 
was was just it was not only fun, it was just so gratifying. Uh because we we so many of us came from situations where again we were a very small minority in a predominantly white high school. So you come together and you 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 get together and you work on a project, you see it through and everybody is working and nobody cares who gets the credit. Yes, I, I am. I'm extremely proud of that. And actually, my fraternity, Kappa Alpha Psi, was one of the first that actually had uh, somewhat of a different ethnicity uh, in, in our fraternity, in our historically black uh, fraternity. Uh, so again, that's, those are the kinds of things that just happen naturally when people decide that let's do things based on what we have in common rather than exaggerating our differences. I, I would like to just mention, if, if you haven't already read these books, these are resources that uh, I just think all of us need to read, and, and our younger people in particular. One is uh, this book, It's Okay to Leave the Plantation by C. Mason Weaver. You can get it at Amazon and books like, uh, books, book uh, outlets like that. The other is When Nations Die by Jim Black. And one other is Come on, people, on the path from victims to victors by Bill Cosby and Alvin Passant. And they, 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 they all three have a different message, but encompassing these three books are where I am as a result of 59 years of life and uh, some 40 years after being here at UTM and working as a physician who is taking care of people from every background, every age, uh, my practice in Tiffany County mirrors the community. Uh, it is not predominantly one or the other. It is truly a mirror image of the community. And uh, those experiences in life have forced me to look at what things work and what things don't. So those books and resources I would urge you to get. Thank you. We have one more question. We have one more question. Yes. actually through my high school counselor, and also so, uh, three of the, the 18 students who originally went uh, to the predominantly white high school, Haywood High School, had already enrolled here at UTM. So of course, obviously, we kept in close contact. So the, those students and my high school counselor. Yes, ma'am. I think it's it's all about the dream, and I'm not talking about you know Dr. Martin Luther King's dream, even though it's accomplished. And that's this: any way that we can get a young person, even before they get to college, to be able to look into the future and to see themselves in that dream, being the adult with the lifestyle, uh, with the uh, with the other whatever it is that they want to be in life. If we can get them to see themselves in that role ahead, then they ha all we've got to do is fill in the blanks between there. In other words, connect the dots. But until that student sees themselves in that role in the future, then it doesn't happen. So it's all about building a dream for that individual student of what they want to be at what point in time and hopefully showing them examples of what that person can be. Get them around somebody who is doing what they think they want to do in the future. 
Again, thank you so much. I hope I haven't gone over. I know it's uh, time to go eat. I remember what it was like when I had been in class all day, is that you didn't want anybody to do anything that was going to keep you from lunch. So uh, thank you. Dr. Cannon, in, uh, in behalf of the 50th Anniversary Committee, uh, Student Affairs and Minority Affairs, we'd like to present your toast. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank you.